public enemy exaded, employed exaggerated violent imagery to communicate their message. Their logo is a silhouetted figure in the crosshairs of a gun. Their army of security clad in fatigues, the security of the first world. Their production team, the bomb squad. And the literal clock hanging from Flava Flav's neck signified knowing what time it is. That is, knowing what's actually happening in the now. So-called old school fans who lament the dearth of socially conscious hip hop and the contemporary landscape romanticized this era as a golden age. But the fact is that by the time P.E. dropped their full-length masterpiece, Fear of a Black Planet, in 1990, the landscape of hip-hop was already being revolutionized by West Coast group N.W.A., pioneers of so-called gangster rap. When it dropped in 1989, N.W.A.'s album, Straight Outta Compton, was the, hot, was the shot heard around the hip-hop world. It came from California, then seen as less legitimate than hip-hop from the music's birthplace in New York City. And while artists like Ice-T and Schooly D had employed, employed violent imagery before, Nothing was as over the top as NWA, which stands for niggas with attitude. Atop the pioneering production of Dr. Dre, rappers Ice, -T, e Ice Cube, Easy e and MC Ren laid down lyrical realness that stemmed from their poor, violence-plagued Los Angeles neighborhood of South Compton, but was equally or more influenced by the profanity-laced comedy records of Richard Pryor, whom they idolized. Though the most attention gets paid to the first three songs on the album, Straight Outta Compton, Fuck the Police, and Gangsta Gangsta, what gets forgotten is that the rest of that album are just party songs about girls and hanging out with your buds and getting down in the club. Even Fuck the Police is as much a dismissal, a don't worry about them, as it is an aggressive stance. One of the earliest promoters of NWA was, unconsciously, the FBI, who sent a strongly worded letter to Priority Records that they were keeping an eye on this group. As word spread that the crew had find, found their way onto the, FB, the FBI's radar, it only helped them sell more and more records, just as the parental advisory sticker did. As Terry McDermott wrote in the LA Times in 2002, quote, in almost any other medium, the same content would have been, been received more calmly. It would have, would have been analyzed as an artistic stance, not a lifestyle. These weren't, after all, real gangsters. Dre would have been exalted as a postmodern master, ma a postmodern master, Frank Gehry at the mixing board, cobbling scraps of James Brown, James Brown funk to cool Euro techno in a way that made both seem more alive. Cube would have been an, a political commentator on CNN, and Easy es autobiography would have been a business school staple. People forget that these were songs, fictions. Almost inevitably, establishment forces denounced straight out of Compton, and it set off a long-running, unresolved debate about the content of pop culture." Unquote. Straight out of Compton not only helped birth the West Coast hip-hop scene and the gangster rap movement, but the ways in which hip-hop records are sold. With no radio promotion, pr produced for $8,000 and financed by Priority Records, whose only mark on popular culture was a million-selling novelty record by the California Raisins, Compton sold three million copies. In 2003, VH1 named it the 62nd greatest album of all time. Spin named it number 10 on the 100 greatest albums from 1985 to 1995. Rolling Stone ranked it at number 144 of the 500 greatest albums of all time. The record industry only saw three million sales and no radio play. They quickly moved to capitalize on that potential and slide, signed a slew of hip-hop artists who presented similar perspectives. And gangster rap ruled the hip-hop scene throughout the, the rest of the 1990s and continues to be a strong market to this day. Keeping it real continued to be a key element in selling legitimacy in hip-hop regardless of race. The lack of real street credibility helped turn an artist like Vanilla Ice into a punchline while his, his rise in the Detroit hip-hop scene made Eminem more than a pretender in what is still seen to this day as a black music form. Eminem may have had credibility, but it was the fantastic production on his records that helped, helped make him a, a hip-hop mainstay and one of the music's top sellers. That production was, of course, by Dr. Dre, who, who honed his skills on the streets of Compton as the musical genius behind N.W.A. Which brings us to 50 Cent. In the, constant, in the context of gangster rap's history, 50 Cent honestly is a bit of a lyrical puffball compared to some of the, more, the music's more extreme purveyors. But he arrived with a backstory better than any marketing department could have written. As part of his early life as a street thug and drug dealer, 50 had been shot nine times and survived. His record label made sure that that story was at the forefront of promotion for his la major label breakthrough, Get Rich or Die Tryin', in 2003. 
I'm not particularly interested in, in dissecting 50s lyrical content, poring over his words to find the nuggets of violence, of misogyny, or of homophobia that are certainly there. Be because I don't think that those lyrics are the root of 50 Cent's art, nor of his popularity. First of all, as you've seen, he's such a ridiculous mumbler that it's a challenge to even decipher what the hell he's saying. And second, because his album is, success is successful not for what he says, but for the bumping produc production that backs him. 50 Cent may spiritually harken back to the gangster rap of the early 90s, but musically it owes mo much to the Dirty South, the spare, beat-heavy sound that's dominated mainstream hip-hop in this decade. In the Dirty South, it's all about getting crunk, that is, partying, having a good time, getting down in the club, getting laid. It's dance music. 50 Cent's biggest hits, In the Club and PIMP, take that sound and merge it with hip-hop's original New York roots. It's no coincidence that, pro that the production, that is, the musical tracks that back his lyrical message, messages is handled on four tracks by, you guessed it, Dr. Dre, and two more are handled by Dre's prodigy turned star maker, Eminem. Successful rappers are performers, first and foremost, selling an image of themselves to their audience. It's not who they are, it's a simplified version of themselves offered up for easy pop culture consumption. No wonder that so many of them have become actors since their musical careers are practically method acting on stage and on record. Ice Cube has gone from, from heading, as they were called at the time, the world's most dangerous group in NWA, to headlining three different lucrative family film franchises. Ice-T, who penned the controversial Cop Killer in 1990, now plays a cop in a Law & Order franchise show. Other rapper actors, too, too numerous to mention. And one final point that I'd like to make concerns mainstream media's assumption about a hip-hop audience that somehow the music's consumers are unable to discern fiction from reality. Dr. Dre has compared Straight Outta Compton to Pulp Fiction and says that the songs are dark comedies and wonders why people don't see that. Alan Light, founding editor of hip-hop magazine Vibe, told the LA Times' Terry McDermott that, quote, the difference is in the level of respect accorded to the, not to the artists, but to the audience. The audience for movies is presumed to know better, to be able to distinguish fact from fiction. The hip-hop audience, presumably, cannot, unquote. That that stereotype persists, that someone hearing fuck the police will see that as a call, call to arms when someone hearing I shot the sheriff will not, I believe says more about how mainstream culture views hip-hop as an art form and that that impression is more dangerous to society as a whole than any violent fantasy that comes mumbling and tumbling out of Fiddy's mouth. Thank you. So you have three questions now that uh, uh, we're going to invite you to, uh, to answer. First, first question. For the decision I have to make, remember you're the CEO of this company and you're going to decide whether or not you're going to accept this contract. For the decision I have to make, this presentation was highly relevant, marginally relevant, not sure, or not relevant. Would you take this into account as you made your decision if you were aware of this information? You have about a minute to vote. One, two, three, or four. You've all voted. We'll close the uh, uh, close the vote and see what the what turns up. Oh, I think you passed. <laughs> so there's what people, you people, are feeling collectively and individually about that particular presentation. Ronaldo. Oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. I, I, uh, yeah, I, I've been here too long. The, uh, we have two other questions we want you to answer. The first is, as a result of this uh, presentation, my position has changed or not changed? Okay, 